Thank you very much for this invitation to speak here today. I am very happy about this visit to the Paul University, which unfortunately will end today, sometime this afternoon. But always good things have an end. And I guess the beauty of having an end is allow us to a new beginning. So I hope that what we together share today is not going to end at the door of this auditorium, but maybe mark a new beginning once we go out of this auditorium. I feel very humble here after the introductions because uh, I'm speaking to the experts. And sometimes when you speak to the experts, you really need to be a little bit careful about what you say and how you say it. <laughs> However, having been a professor at the University of Chile, at the Catholic University in Santiago, at the Catholic University in Valparaíso, at the time of our social revolution, we had one thing in mind at the time, to protect the integrity and the freedom of the university. And so I believe that in a university environment, is exactly an environment not to please the establishment. It's the, it's the environment where everyone here uh, has the right to express its own opinion in a pluralistic and respectful way. So I will not stop myself from saying what I have to say today, and I hope I will not offend anyone, and it's not my intention, but I think we are living times where we cannot just wait any longer. I think uh, for those who are sitting comfortably somewhere, they must understand that there is a lot of action taking place and the university must be the first sponge to capture what's happening outside. So learning doesn't become a collection of theoretical propositions, but actually becomes a mirror image of human reality. I'd like to start with two or three different things that might canvas a little bit what I'm going to say today. I was a soccer player for many, many years. Actually, I played soccer semi-professional in the United States, in the Midwest. I was a goalkeeper. And so I was fascinated by many things that have happened in soccer, in football, as we call it in Latin America. One of them was an interview that was given to Pelé, Edson Arantes do Nascimento. Pelé score thousands of goals in one career. So in an interview a few years ago, he was asked, how come you score so many goals? And Pelé's answer was, I saw them three seconds before they happened. I saw Pelé only three times in my life. I was very young, and actually I could not figure out how he would send the ball to some place in the field where I would never send the ball there, but there was always someone there to receive that ball or score a goal, you know. Beckenbauer, you know, the president of the FIFA, you know, the, the International Federation of uh, Football, his answer was almost identically the same, you know, that, that he had this something that allowed him to be such a good German soccer player, probably as good as Pelé and probably one of the best in the history of, of football, you know. When Michael Jordan retired, he was asked also, how come you score so many baskets, you know? And I don't remember exactly the, the details of the interview, but I remember something like this. I, I go to the locker room, I visualize the basket before the game, and then I execute in the court. My final story, before I get into the topic, but these are the stories of the topic, because if we don't understand this, this has no meaning. I went to Russia when I was at the World Bank. I was asked to help Russia on a project in Lake Baikal. Lake Baikal is probably the only source of fresh water that is almost untouched. Now it's very touched, unfortunately. And I had a driver, Vasily, who was absolutely a crazy guy in the good sense. You know, he, he was really. Uh, a driver you don't like to have because of the speed at which he, he drove and also in a very uh, not very well maintained sort of Russian Lada Fiat type of car. But one day he said, I know about your spiritual inclinations, you know. 
So I made this tour for you outside the World Bank. You know, I want you to, to come with me because I want to show you something. So Vasily took me to this incredible, beautiful, exuberant, spectacular monastery of the Orthodox Church. A functioning monastery, it was not a museum, you know. And this is the center stage for artists who paint icons. You know, icons, those in, in wood and, and, and silver, you know. It's a very interesting um, art. So I went through many pieces of, of these icons on the wall of many rooms in the monastery, and I realized a couple of things which were very interesting. One is that the expression of the saint or Christ or Mary, whoever they were putting into this icon, was not like the same expression you see in other paintings. There was something alive in these paintings, you know, that the expression of the eyes, I don't know what it was, but basically it was something very, very uh, powerful. So I asked the abbot of the monastery who accompanied me everywhere, I said, how many weeks someone takes to actually paint these icons. And to my astonishment, now not, I would not be astonished now, but 20 years ago I was astonished. He said they take at least six to eight years. So I said, how come, you know? This is just a little piece of wood. It's not too much surface. I mean, this is not a mural of some stadium. He said, nobody can paint in this uh, monastery unless he has at least two or three years of meditation on the figure, on the spiritual being they want to paint. Then they have two years of understanding colors, because all colors in that monastery are natural colors. They combine dirt with a certain color with urines of cows and make yellow and you know it's a very very interesting process. And then they have one year to study the use of egg whites in the finishing of these icons. So I said, wait a minute, you know, how come 293 credits makes me a PhD, you know? Uh, how come I finish my PhD in two and a half years? Why these people have certain conditions to get where they want to go? And we don't want to fulfill these conditions. So today, you know, when we talk about this issue of the spiritual dimensions of the entrepreneurship, we need to go to the roots of a fundamental question, which is what does it make an entrepreneur? Because, uh, you know, I have a son, 34 years of age. His name is also Alfredo. One day he gave me a huge lecture when I said, you as an empresario, da 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 da, he said, I'm sorry, I am not an empresario, I am an entrepreneur. And you better understand the difference, you know? So he gave me a big lecture about the difference between an, a, an entrepreneur and a business person. Now, before I enter into the topic, for many, many years I've been looking into the role of spirituality in economics, and I already lectured on that, I will not lecture on that today. But also, I've been fascinated by the connection between spirituality and the workplace. You know, wh why, why should this? So I have done a lot of research, and I found one research uh, st study in the United States that it shocked me. They interviewed 253 very young managers, sort of moving up into the ladder. And they were asked, what really motivates you in your career? And these young uh, managers responded that, almost I think number 12 or 13, that they only around that level, not first two, three, four, five, about money. Money was not their motivation at all. Maybe we, the old managers, <laughs> maybe are different after all these scandals about the perks and so on. But these young managers, you know, didn't put at the, at the top. You know, the top was personal growth. 
That was the first answer. The most popular answer was personal growth. They also talk about autonomy, satisfaction, trustworthiness, capacity to make decisions freely. You know, it was all a collection of human values. Autonomy is a human value. It's not uh, something you buy in the supermarket. Trustworthiness, it's also part of yourself. Uh, satisfaction, there is nothing more personal than defining satisfaction. I'm sure if we do a research here, everyone will answer differently. Then, accompanying this particular survey, you know, there was a, a survey for workers. And here are some numbers that are also, to me, not abnormal after having been at the World Bank and having conducted surveys of attitude surveys of World Bank staff. In the United States, 72% of the workers say they work more than eight hours a day. 61% think that they are flooded with work, that work floods them. 86% is not satisfied with its work. This is a huge number, you can imagine. So, in your company, <laughs> the probability of finding a satisfied person with the work is only 14%. The probability is that 86 times out of 100, the person you pick up will say, look, uh, there is something wrong with what I'm doing. 82% is very dissatisfied with the relationship between work and its private life. I remember when we did a survey, two or three surveys at the World Bank, this was the worst part of the survey and it reflected in the rate of divorce, suicides, alcoholism, drug abuse, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you know? When the work invades your private life, you know? And the last statistic, which uh, also is very frightening for those who are managers, I don't know, I, I see people who have face of managers, maybe they are not, but <laughs> they look like managers to me. 86% hopes to change jobs in the next six months. <laughs> <laughs> so what is your stability, you know, how the, your stability looks in the long term? Uh, these are all in, in the internet and, and they are all published statistics. I, I, I didn't do this research, I just used the numbers. I think what all of this is calling for is a huge challenge to find a new way, a new architecture, a new structure for corporate world in the future. There is no doubt that something is happening that keeps us very close to the wall and we might hit the wall. In Portugal, for example, where I live, when the government announced that we were facing a world crisis, you never saw such a run into bankruptcy ever in Portugal. You know, the, the owners went immediately to close business. You know, we are in a crisis, sorry, you are unemployed, out. They have created, you know, 430,000 unemployed, which is a lot of people because in Portugal there are only 2 million families. The country has only 10 million people. So when you, when you have a family of, two, let's say, 2 million and a half families in the country, let's say two of them work, half of them work, so you have 1 million and some people are in the workplace. So if you unemploy 430,000 in, in three or four months, it's not a really a good scene, you know? And actually the left wing parties of Portugal are saying those who have profits cannot fire anyone. We are in a time of crisis. So, so there is a, this tension between the thinking of the corporate world and what is happening there. I've been thinking about this topic of uh, spiritual entrepreneurship for over 25 years. At the beginning, nobody listened at all. It was absolutely a, something very spiritual, you know. That's the way people refer at the time. And I have gone through a cycle of three stages. The first stage of my learning curve was to try to understand the corporate world in developing countries. Because I come from a developing countries, what is the relation between business, domestic as well as coming from abroad, and the environment. Chile, at the time when I was doing this study, 80% of export of Chile were minerals, so were extractive industries. And what was left behind the extractive industry were huge holes 
uh, environmentally impossible to recover and socially the mining workers you know are not the ones who get the highest salaries and have the best uh, situations in in our countries not only in Chile you just go to Pennsylvania and you will find out what the coal mining town is and, and how it works it took me a long time to understand this and I don't really pretend that I understand it but I went to a second cycle in learning which I decided to get into this uh, concept of social corporate responsibility. So I decided to try to contribute to this corporate responsibility. And I think where I got frustrated was the lack of consensus of what the term responsibility really means. And I'll come back to this in a minute. Uh, and the other source of my frustration was that the corporations began to use the language very, very well, very quickly. So all these internet sites began to change. You know, they were absolutely beautiful. There is basically no website of a large corporation that doesn't have these pages of social responsibility. But the public, this is not a, I'm not standing here to criticize corporation. I'm just putting a diagnostic to put my topic into place, you know. You know, if, if you ask the public in general, they, they don't believe. There are cases, you know, there is a beautiful case, Exxon Valdez, you know, uh, and it's been written a lot in the literature, in economics, in environmental economics, in social sciences. There was a huge debate about whether Exxon actually believed in the environment of Alaska or not, you know. So the public in general are seeing this language being sort of high volume, but practice very low volume. The third part of my, my cycle is, is this one on entrepreneurship. And basically my question was whether the debate on entrepreneurship ended at the level of social entrepreneurship, which uh, Professor Chada already mentioned in his introductory remarks, which I really, really appreciate very much. Whether the, the story ends with social entrepreneurship. And my answer to you is actually it does not. And the second thing that is very linked to this is the question of entrepreneurship and styles of management. I think many people are running very fast with the topic of entrepreneurship as a separate issue from corporate management. And I don't think this is possible to separate, particularly if you are in the business of incubators you know, for future technology action and so on for the corporate world. So I got entangled into these two topics, you know, one topic is to say something about entrepreneurship, but at the same time say something about management. So entering now directly into this swimming pool, I will combine some of these topics. I will not talk exclusively about entrepreneurship and try to dissect it to the last cell, but really give you a perspective also on what's happening at the management level. Because the temperament in the corporate world is, is like a unity. It's not something that you can separate. You know, the trends, it's going in, in, all, in all directions. So one way to really enter into this conversation is to transit into a debate on values. And I ask myself the question whether there are new and universal values that everyone could adhere to. Because if we talk about social corporate responsibility, or if we talk about the future trends of entrepreneurship, and actually we have no agreement on the value system that support these trends, then these are all short-term gains somewhere and net losses very quickly. So the question is whether universal values exist for the corporate world everywhere to adhere to. Secondly, whether there is a set of universal values that entrepreneurs and managers should adopt in their everyday practices. And so we can compare, you know, an entrepreneur or a manager in Santiago, Chile, with one in Chicago, and the conversation will be such that they will understand exactly where they are in reference to these values. 
or whether the corporate world actually is self-normative. In other words, they, norm, they create their own norms, their own values for themselves and different from the rest of society. Is this possible? Is this desirable that actually we in our society have a code like playing tennis? We need to know what the rules of tennis are. So the corporate world plays another tennis game and we play this tennis game. For example, in our tennis game, we use the inner line to see whether you score, but the corporate world can have the outer line whether they, they keep playing the game or not. This is very important. And it's not an esoteric question because then how do you teach students in a university if you have not answered these questions? What type of product are you creating if you are not value-based? <laughs> I don't know what are based. Textbook-based, you know? If you're not value-based in teaching, particularly in a Catholic university like this one, you know, what, what, is, what is this? So in doing this, this debate on, on transiting to, to these goals and, and objectives of corporation, whether they're universal or not, to the students of this university, not to the faculty, I will leave a question while I keep speaking for you to reflect upon whether it makes any difference to study entrepreneurship in DePaul University or in the University of New Delhi or the Indian Institute of Management or in NCAD in France or in Peking in China. Does it really make any difference? Should it make a difference for me as a potential student to make that choice or actually it doesn't matter? Now, I did a study of curricula that doesn't speak much, you know? It's like a menu in a restaurant, unless you really taste the food. Basically, you don't know whether it's a good Thai food or not. But if you look at theoretically for someone, you find that actually all these programs are identical. The MBAs are basically identical. I remember like 150 students from India came to Geneva when I was ambassador for the World Bank in Geneva. And they wanted me to speak about management. Like if they wanted to know more accounting, finance, and so on, you know. I said, no, 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 I want to know from you whether you feel you are different. You know, what is the difference between having a graduate from the Indian Institute of Management and a graduate from DePaul University? Where would the dialogue go? Where is the common ground and where are the differences? If there are no differences, then we have a serious problem. The university has become part of a very unknown, you know, uh, orderless type of entrepreneur. So when we transit into these values, it is very difficult to find people who will agree that there are certain universal values. Many people say, look, you know, this is Indonesia, you know. You, you don't, don't ask, you know, the Indonesians don't think the same way as the people from Chicago, you know. We are willing to sacrifice some points here and some points there. The value of profit, naturally, is very important. And that is not very contested. I think everyone in corporation will say, look, this is my duty, and if you ask Milton Friedman, well, Milton is not here anymore, he will say, that's the only value of a corporation, don't, don't even worry about anything else. This is the same debate at the international level with the World Trade Organization, isn't it? They are in the commercial business, they are in the, in the business of commerce and trade, but if there is a labor issue, go to the ILO, you know? If there is an environmental issue, go to UNEP. You know, don't bring it here. Here we just try to figure out onions and fish, you know, and if we can get this equation right, it's okay. Some student will say, Alfredo, this is not true, you know, actually we have this triple bottom line. And, and, and the triple bottom line, it's uh, very simple. Profits, environment, and social. But I ask myself whether this is possible. And I say it's not possible unless certain things are met. First, because mathematically speaking, there is no way to work in a transitive way in this triangle. 
That is to say, if solution A, you know, has this high level of profit preserving the environment, is not a sufficient condition that this solution will give you a socially desirable outcome. The same thing if you do profit and social, it doesn't necessarily say that you will have an environmentally acceptable solution. So there is not a method to deal with triangles. You need an objective function on the top of it to resolve this. And my PhD was actually on optimal control theory, you know, trying to figure these things mathematically. So this approach is intransitive. Is A is greater than B, and B is greater than C, does not follow that A is better than C. <coughs> Secondly, and more important, because this is a theoretical thing that we will not really resolve here, is that the market as an instrument, as a, as a signal sender to corporation, does not send the same coherent signals, the same decibels of sound to the three equally. The market is not sending the same signals to profit as it sends to the environment or to the social impact. So if the market, which is the core of a corporate world, is not actually sending the signals equally to these three, the question is how do you get them to be coherent in one place? Where will this coherence come from? Now, Adam Smith, you know, one of the founders of economics, said, don't worry, you know, sooner or later, the individual behavior will amount to collective behavior. And he talked about the invisible hand, you know, that there is some invisible hand that will maneuver everything in a way that actually what is individually acceptable, it will be collectively acceptable. And most of us economists make money out of this debate of individual choices versus collective choices. You know, if you look at economics writing, most of it is, even environmental economics, which is my specialty, is about the economics of this triangle. Secondly, this triangle is not new. This is a copy of what we did in the environmental economics. Who is come first or not, it doesn't matter. I'm sure if I am in the faculty of economics, I will say, you know, we were first. We talk about economics, economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, and social sustainability. This was the first concept of sustainable development, although we never defined what this meant. And we never defined what this means either. It's easy to define this one as it is easy to define this one because we have spent a lot of attention on economics and on profits, you know. And then we link this triangle here to the theory of economic growth. So economics, sustainability was linked to man-made capital, physical and financial. Environmental sustainability to the environment, environmental capital. And the social to social capital. And many of us work in different things in a very isolated way because to understand this relationship is not trivial. This is another thing people talk about, yes, triple bottom line, but these relationships are super complex. You know, what is the relationship between the technology of the company and the net pollution impact of the company? You really need to be a professional of high quality to really give this and say, yes, actually, I am responsible f for so many particles per impossible. The same thing about the impact on the social. Many corporations in my country will say, this thing is the government, you know? You know, I cannot do social engineering in Chile. I'm just Exxon. You know, if you expect that I will do social engineering for Chileans and replace the democratic system, and replace government, then something is wrong. I used to say the same thing when I was at the World Bank, you know. I, I, am, I was not responsible for social engineering. It, it, I, I cannot do social engineering in India. I think the, the, the Indians know better than anyone else how to do social engineering in their own country. I cannot come from the Hilton Hotel for two weeks every six months, you know, and do social engineering in India, so I will change the caste system of India. It's not possible. I think it's too pretentious and absurd to do that. So, so when we talk about this triple bottom line, you know, it looks so simple, but it's not so simple. 
There are not too many experts on this bottom line. I was in Paris not long ago at a major conference on entrepreneurship and human rights. I might send you the paper because I tried to connect human rights with this. What was most interesting, it was the aggressive tone of the people in the entrepreneurial school of not accepting a debate on human rights to the point that they took it out of the conclusions of the whole conference. And someone who had a very high level and power level in the UK, he said, Alfredo, your statement is so good, but we in our world today with the world crisis, there is not even a triple bottom line, there is only one bottom line, which is profit. And this is real. This is not something, you know, that I am doing it in an easy way and, and sort of dropping a footnote here. There is a big, big crowd in that world that believe that this triple bottom line really doesn't go very far. By the way, the corporate, the, the corporate world is not the only one facing this. We are facing a world crisis today. And I find two attitudes. One attitude is saying, what crisis? I have been lecturing in Portugal, and, and a very, very powerful uh, businessman, I don't, I don't want to confuse the terminology, so my son, when he sees the tapes, will not really teach me again about the difference. He said, it's no, no crisis, it's no crisis. So then I went back to him and I said, well, who, who created this then? So, so what is this, you know? Is there or there is no crisis? And then the other one is that this crisis has a very important element in it, different from every crisis I have participated in since 1973. This crisis is a collective crisis. It's not an individualistic, materialistic crisis. That is to say it needs collective instrument and collective solutions and we don't have the collective institutional arrangement to do it. The same thing happened with the triple bottom line. This part of the bottom line, you can do it yourself, you know. You have good people to really get your profit going. But environment and social are collective issues, they are not private issues. So even the, the conceptual framework behind this, the value system running these three, is completely different. So how do you create an objective function that allows you to move here or here when these are private and these are collective? So I continue going on this issue of universal values. And I only found one document, actually, that has a world consensus on universal values, which is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that nobody cares, that nobody respects, you know? And I dare in Paris in September, when I met Pat there, you know, I dare to say, look, the world has evolved, let's look into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and do the changes needed, because we are in 2009 and not in 1948. And one very high level minister former Prime Minister of a European country said, Alfredo, there is not a mood to create any collective consensus today, so don't tinkle with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Because if we submit a new set of rights, a new set of, a new understanding of human rights, in his view, and I think he's quite right, there is no way that the United Nations system will say, yes, now we have a new declaration of human rights. So we are in a problem here, we are in a quantum when we talk about business, corporations, entrepreneurship, is this tension between individual existence and collective existence. And these are fundamental elements to actually get into entrepreneurship and spiritual entrepreneurship. I would say that when we talk about entrepreneurship, we are going through a, a cycle that doesn't have two levels, it has three. And it's not really, really geared or determined by external factors alone. 
like when I read some of the the things that are in the internet and maybe I am not interpreting well what is in the internet you know explore launch grow and evolve but all the reference points are external is the business evolution it's the exploration of business opportunities and so on nothing in this write-up talks about my inner exploration my inner growth my you know inner evolution now when i was young at the world bank we were interested in business entrepreneurship you know people who were very aware of the business you know and i remember trying to find animal implements, plows and so on, of a different type to preserve animals in Asia. And we found, you know, these business entrepreneurs in Australia that had very interesting animal implements where the farmer and the animal will benefit from it. The way in which the, the implement is attached to the animal and the fact that instead of going behind the plow, you can sit. You know, so they had little wheels. You know, we found a lot of business entrepreneurs. In the world of business that you are in here in Chicago, this means that business entrepreneurship is someone who really understands business and creates, you know, in that environment. So we have better technology, more profits and so on on this, on this line here. The next stage of the cycle is what you mentioned, is social entrepreneurship to create an individual that is capable to actually not only be aware of the business, accounting, finance, planning, marketing, client orientation, whatever you want to put in that entrepreneurship, but you are looking for someone who also has a high level of awareness of the environment within which the corporation operates. And these are the other two bottom lines because there is a human environment outside and there is an, a natural environment outside. But my contention with this, and there is an article in the Soul Journal of MIT, when I first put this term spiritual entrepreneurship like 10 years ago, is that you cannot just be aware of the environment without being aware of yourself. It is not possible to dissociate you know, the environment from yourself. So my contention and my proposal today is that we need to move from business entrepreneurship to a social entrepreneurship and from social entrepreneurship to what I call a spiritual entrepreneurship. And a spiritual entrepreneur is an individual with high identity, high self-identity. This is not ego, I'm talking about self-identity. That is to say, is fully aware of him or herself. Doesn't mean that we are equal. We might be very different in the way we are because our identity is different. But for example, let's say that I come from a country X and in my own awareness, poor people are lazy, they are alcoholics, and they are, you know, not interested. Let's say that's my view. How would I deal with the triple bottom line on the social side? I would really not care too much. How do they express this in many articles even? This is the cost of development. You know, I'm sorry Alfredo, but that's the cost of development. These people need to be worse off for everyone to be better off. I have heard this argument so many times in so many sophisticated ways and politically correct ways, but the argument is there. Needless to say that in my career as an environmental economist, I heard the same argument about nature. So you really want to benefit the trees and not the people. Well, it's not that way. You know, if you put me in that corner, naturally, you know, but homocentricity is not necessarily the way to resolve this triple bottom line. So if I don't have awareness or if my understanding of nature is that we, f we have unequal intelligence, that nature is inferior to be conquered, you know, is given to me, I do whatever I want with it, then my self-identity embodies that view and that self-identity influences my capacity to act as a social entrepreneur.